Welcome, my friends, to the On the Blue Line podcast with Wayne Mulder, and I'm your host, Wayne Mulder. This is a law enforcement podcast where we discuss topics that will empower you on and off the job. Maybe you're tired, you're frustrated, you're feeling overworked, or struggling to balance work and home demands, or simply you need some encouragement, then, my friends, you have come to the right place. Welcome to the 152nd episode of the podcast, and on today's podcast, an important very important conversation around mental health and crisis response for law enforcement. If you're just finding us, we have two weekly podcasts. The one you are listening to right now is The Interview Room. So here shortly, I'll be introducing a guest. And in here, I sit down every Thursday at 0500 and have a different guest from a different walk of life who can offer us something that will benefit either our personal or professional life. And then the other podcast that comes out on Mondays is called Morning Roll Call, and it's a weekly monologue show where you and I, we sit down, we have a cup of coffee, we discuss the news, maybe some recent events, law enforcement trends, and a variety of other topics that gives you something to consider as you begin your week. Both shows, this one included, are uh, released on almost all podcast platforms, but they're really geared around video, so be sure to watch on YouTube or on Rumble, and you can uh, always find out more about what we're doing at on the blue line, O-N, on the blue line, dot com. So, this week's guest, before I introduce who he is, I have to warn you, if you are watching on YouTube or Rumble, that uh, as you're watching this video, it's going to get darker and darker and darker to the point where you can barely see the guest at one point. So neither him nor I have any idea what was going on during the uh, recording of this that for some reason he became harder and harder and harder to see as he uh, very slowly dissipated into the black. However, it was also recorded on Halloween night. So whatever that tells you, I don't know. However, the guest was Ernest, or Ernie, as he goes by, Stevens. He's a published author. Uh, He's got a book out, Mental Health and De-Escalation, a guide for law enforcement professionals. He was the contributing author for uh, Police Mental Barricade, and he was a police officer for 28 years, 26 of those with the San Antonio Police Department, where he was a founding member of the Mental Health Unit. He's been featured on the Emmy Award-winning HBO documentary, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, and he's been featured on NBC's documentary, A Different Kind of uh, Force. And he really, they were one of the first ones that really started down this road of crisis intervention training and uh, dealing with people who were in crisis. So he's got a uh, bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He's uh, married to his wife, Lisa, who he attended school uh, with since the elementary school and has two incredible children. And he continues to assist communities, build and program, manage multidisciplinary response teams, pairing a clinician, an officer, and a medic together to respond to crisis calls. And he currently works with the Southwest Texas uh, Regional Advisory Council, as well as the as well as being a crisis response and resiliency manager. So I know that was a mouthful. However, Ernie is a great guy. He's someone I actually wanted to have on the show from the very beginning of this in 2019. uh, After seeing that documentary, Crisis Cops, which if you haven't seen it and you are in law enforcement, and especially if you do anything in the mental health space. I highly, highly encourage you to look at it, or if you're an administrator and you're hearing all these buzzwords and you're thinking, well, I want to do something, I I really encourage you to watch it. And uh, as we go through this interview, you're going to hear a lot of those type questions as kind of what worked, what didn't, and what his thoughts are as far as that goes. So without taking any more time, here's this week's guest, Ernie Stevens. Well, Ernie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. I've been following you for a while on Twitter, and I'm glad we finally had the chance to uh, meet sort of in person, I guess, uh, the electronic version of in person. (laughs) Yes, likewise. I've been uh, following your work as well and appreciate what you do with your platform. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Let's start simple, uh, as I like to do. Coffee or tea, Ernie? Oh, coffee all day long. <laughs> now, are you one of these guys you got to add some things to it or? No, no, don't put nothing in my, make it hot and leave it alone. That That's a good answer. And that is what I would expect all cops to say. But you know what? That isn't the way that, that's why I continue to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, no, man, it's changing. They're like drinking almond milk now or something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, do you have a favorite place to have that drink? Like a place that brings you peace? Mm. 
at home. I, I enjoy drinking coffee at home. And then I also go camping quite a bit in a, I've got an RV and sometimes making coffee and just sitting outside, you know, and early in the morning or in the evening when the sun's going down, it, that's always a good time, uh, relaxing. Absolutely. Do you have a best or worst travel story? Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know, probably best. Um, some of the best trips I've ever taken, of course, are um, are all going to be family related. Um, I have had some good business trips as well, though, um, that relate uh, really back to the documentary. I've met some wonderful people, but uh, time spent with family. Um, every year we go somewhere for my daughter's birthday. She kind of gets to pick. She's a little spoiled. So this year I'm looking forward. We're going to uh, Gulf Waters, Alabama. Uh, I've never been there, and I hear they got beautiful beaches and uh, a nice community down there. So I'm looking forward to that. Very nice. Yeah, that Gulf Coast, I, I haven't been to that part of Alabama, but the Florida Gulf Coast is amazing. So because I'm down here in the uh, central Florida region, so every once in a while we can get up that way. Yeah, we've uh, we've actually driven from Texas out to Disney a couple of times, and we always stop in Destin and just have the best time there. So it's like we get there and I'm like, do we really want to keep going on to Orlando or can we just stay here for the, the rest of the trip? And it's that it is beautiful. Yeah. And then you get to Orlando and you realize you should have stayed in Destin. But that's <laughs> sorry, that's nailed just it. my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. You're right. <laughs> so let me ask you, do you have a favorite uh nonfiction modern book? Favorite nonfiction. Um believe it or not, I I mean to me, the Bible. I love the Bible. I read it every every day. Um, do a Bible study with a group of guys every single morning. Um, I also enjoy uh, Andy Harvey's book, Excellence in Policing. I've I've learned a lot about uh, just how to be a better police officer, a better person. Uh, books that really empower and encourage are, are books that I like to read nonfiction. Very good. Yeah, and I'll have to look that one up. I've actually never heard of it. Um, Excellence in Policing. So I will look that one up and check yeah. it out. Well, let's start there. Um, you have the movie poster on the back wall there, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. So the listeners, just so they know when we talk about the documentary, we'll go into it deeper, but that's what we're referring to. But let's back up a minute and talk about you going into law enforcement because you're retired now. Is that correct? I am. I retired January. Well, January of 2021, I retired from law enforcement, but uh, I didn't stay retired very long. Uh, the honeydew list kept getting longer and the pay sucked. So I decided to go back, go back to work. <laughs> that That is what eventually happens for all of us, I think, <laughs> especially those that were fortunate enough to uh, retire younger. So let me ask you a question. So where did you start? Where What brought you into law enforcement originally? What's kind of your origin story? Yeah, um, you know, growing up, it was just always that draw, you know, towards law enforcement. It, it seemed like wherever I was working as a kid growing up in my adolescent years, uh, there was always like an off-duty officer that was working there and uh, would would talk to the officer and, and get a little insight into what their day-to-day -day activity was. And the best thing I liked about their stories was, you know, every day was different, you know. Uh, in high school, they offered a law enforcement class. So they I had a great retired San Antonio <clears throat> police detective by the name of Duke Harlow. Um, and that's been a long time ago. Uh, and I still have breakfast with him today, believe it or not. Uh, the that's man's awesome. in his upper eighties and, um, he was that much of an influence. So it, it was people that, um, influenced my life and, and, uh, really shined the, the nobility of the profession of law enforcement into my life because, um, when I was supposed to go into food service, you know, my parents owned a restaurant, my grandparents owned a restaurant. They were sending me to culinary school. And I was like, I just, I'm not feeling this, man. I mean, I love to eat, but. Right. That's yeah, different just, than being on the other side there. Yeah. I mean, they work too hard. You know, they work seven days a week and I'm like, I need days off. And then I joined law enforcement. I had no days off. So I guess either way. The irony of it all. That is yeah. one thing in the documentary that kind of cracks me up is you guys working off duties all the time, but we'll talk yeah. about that here in a yeah. minute. But um, so. Uh, what what roles and positions did you hold during your time? I, I know for everybody, usually starting some sort of patrol function, but what did your career path kind of look like from there before we get to obviously the subject matter of what we're talking about? Yeah, sure. So originally, I started off at a very small agency in uh, in in Texas called Terrell Hills, very small, but a uh, very uh, influential neighborhood. Um, movie stars, basketball players, you know, lived in this uh, in this, in this small little city. So it was very customer service oriented and mindset. Uh, but I was 21 years old 
uh, just getting started and the town had like 5,000 people in it. So I lasted about two years there, which I, I actually enjoyed my time because even in patrol in these smaller agencies, you get to fulfill a lot of uh, the job um, uh, needs that you don't in a larger agency, right? For example, I learned how to do my own fingerprinting, uh, photographing scenes, casting uh, molds if I needed to cast a mold. Um, when I transferred and, and joined the San Antonio Police Academy a few years later, I mean, you just get on the mic and say, hey, start me an evidence technician out here to handle all this, right? And then you move right. on to the next call. So I spent a couple of years at a smaller agency, went to San Antonio. When I got to San Antonio, just like you said, started out in patrol. I then became a field training officer after about five years, which is fairly early on in a career in a large agency because my field training officer had almost 30 years on. So wow. uh, I got picked fairly early in my career. I always was, you know, I hustled to all the calls, really tried to put a hundred percent effort into all of them. And my supervisor saw that. So I got sent to FTO school, did, did that for a few years. And then I went to the DWI task force, spent almost three years uh, working DWIs and then went to the tactical response unit, which is our our gang unit. Uh, they just rename it every now and then to something. As they all do. Uh, as they all do. So every agency does that. <laughs> yes. Spent some time in the gang unit. Um, and then after uh, almost 15 years on the department, uh, helped create and establish the very first mental health unit for the San Antonio Police Department. And that's where I spent my last uh, 13 years. You know, retired right at almost 28 years. Did you um, go to CIT first before you guys ended up uh, creating the mental health unit or which is the chicken and which is the egg for you? Yeah, for sure. So the San Antonio Police Department did not have a mental health unit. In fact, in my time in the academy back in the early 90s, they didn't train us on crisis intervention. Uh, there was no, um, this is the protocol of how to handle a mental health crisis call. Yeah, I, I never got any of that. It was what you learned from other officers when you got out. Um, they didn't even teach us how to fill out the involuntary commitment form. Never seen one before, you know. So in 2003, while I was working with the gang unit, uh, there was a, a call for a school to go to. And it just so happened to be my day off. And my partner signed me up for this crisis intervention training, which was OK, because when you work nights, you know, and you get to go to school for a week, you get to go to a daylight schedule and yes. sleep in your bed at night and you get a weekend off before the school starts. Monday's so really, rough, but the rest of the week goes pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So who cared? The problem was I cared because when I got back, I found out what the training was about. Um, I had no interest at all in a, in going to this training about mental health and de-escalation. And it was because of my own ignorance. I just, I didn't know enough about the subject. So it scared me. Yeah. Right. I was like, I don't want to go there and get embarrassed. I don't, you know, I don't really know anything about mental health. So you try to avoid those things. Um, and even on patrol, I really did a disservice to those I was serving because I didn't understand, right, uh, the true compassion needed and empathy needed uh, to try to connect with somebody that's in a mental health crisis. So yeah. I showed up on Monday, dreading it because I'm I'm looking at the schedule you know, classes on psychopharmacology. I'm like, man, I can't even say that word. Like, and then there's role plays every day. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, this is going to be the worst. And it was, it was the worst. It was horrible. Uh, for three days, I, I just was dragging through it. Didn't want to be there. But then on day four, I had my aha moment. It, it happened. It, it was a member from the community that came in and told her story about her son that that lives with schizophrenia and her story was so convicting and and so powerful i it just felt like i became part of her family as she was telling this story and my heart's breaking for her and you know she's telling these officers look you know i, I don't want to have to call y'all but i don't have anybody else to call and i don't know what to do when my son goes into crisis and there's times that i might have to call the police and i'm scared that if you show up my son's going to attack you or scare you. And there's a good chance that you might shoot and kill my son. But it's what she said next, Wayne, that changed my entire career path. She said, but if that happens, it's okay. Because you have to go home safe to your family. And that was the aha moment I needed. Because I waited for the class to end. And I went up to her. And I asked her, I said, you know, Miss Owens, why would you say what you said to this group of officers? Why is that okay with you? 
She goes, because this is my life. I live this life. You'll never understand. And besides, what are you going to do about it? Wow. So <laughs> I said, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And it's going to start with paying attention from this point forward. And then that Monday, the following Monday, I actually joined the National Alliance for Mental Illness and became a, a member and dedicated my entire life from that point forward uh, to educating myself and serving the community that that um, that has to deal day in and day out with their mental health diagnoses and times when they go into crisis. I hope that I'm the one that gets to respond. That's awesome. So CIT must not have been an in-agency class. It was like a regional class. Is that uh, why it was kind of separated from what eventually you guys spearheaded a mental health unit? Is that correct? Yeah. So what happened was the Houston Police Department came down to San Antonio to teach us this concept. And it and it's kind of it's fluid. It's a 40 hour course with, if it's based on the Memphis model, but it's tailored to the resources in your community. Right. Yeah. Um, so they came down and they they trained us and it was more like a train the trainer course. And I was so intrigued by this that I took the manual and I went to uh, the supervisor that was actually facilitating the training and I said, can I take this manual? I'll learn more. Trust me. Can I add in the resources that we have here and teach everybody on the San Antonio Police Department? Like, I I, I think this needs to be taught to everyone. And uh, her face, Sergeant Lopez, she was looked at me like, have you lost your mind? Like, what happened to you? Like, aren't you on the gang unit? Like, go like. And I was like. Yeah, but this this affected me. So that's what happened. Uh, we got a train the trainer course. Uh, I took the material, uh, made some changes, updated some slides, and and um, eventually got the okay to to train the entire department. That's awesome. And while we're talking, because I I guess I'll start here and then I'll segue into kind of where I want to go with the mental health unit. But when it comes to uh, CIT, is what I keep saying. But for the listener, that's crisis intervention training. If you're not familiar, but. Um, for CIT, when you uh, teach it now, is it my understanding that they actually teach everybody in the agency as well as new hires, like it's part of the actual curriculum? Is that? Yeah, so it depends on the agency. Um, I know for like CIT International, um, they really are still under the recommendation that you should train at least 20% of your department, 10 to 20%, because they would like for those to volunteer to come to the training yeah. because they want to be there and get the training, right? Right. And I understand that concept, and I and I don't disagree with it. Um, when we were mandated by our chief to teach the entire department to include the cadets, we saw we saw several things. Uh, number one, the cadets that were trained um, really enjoyed the training, and they said, "Wow, this is amazing! Like, how do I get on your unit?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Go learn how to write a ticket first. Like, right? Yeah, um, but they're but, young and hungry, or they're hungry. They just came yeah, into the. It's perfect time. But their field training officers would call us up and say, "Hey." I, you know, this cadet did a ride along with me the other night and told me about this resource. I didn't even know we had, like, when can we get some updates from, you know, from y'all? And I'm like, you got to come through the training, right? So um, the cadets found value in it and they were actually helping out field training officers in the event there were mental health calls and they were fresh out of the training. Um, what we also saw, and it's common sense, right? When you're on patrol, you don't have the luxury to, uh, get a get dispatched to a call and then say, nah, I don't want that call. Right. So, Hey, uh, call sign head over here to this location for this individual that has bipolar disorder and is punching holes in the wall. Nah, I think I'll hold out for, you know, a traffic accident or something. You, you can't do that. So by training everybody, right. You, that excuse of, I don't know what to do anymore, which was me was taken away. Um, and now you become, proficient, right? If you take this training serious and you can change the outcome to these calls, uh, outcomes where you can actually touch and affect people's lives uh, exactly what this job was meant to do in a positive way. Right. No, that's a great way to put it. And that really is the mission of law enforcement in general. And, and I love, uh, well, I love CIT, but let's segue for a minute then. So at some point you were involved in spearheading the actual mental health unit at uh, San Antonio. Is that correct? Yeah, that was not easy. So uh, the the training I went to was in 2003, and then we turned around and started actually training all the officers in about 2005. So it took me a couple of years uh, to get the ball rolling, to get the curriculum done, and, and to establish the class and instructors and role players and speakers. So it took a little bit of time. And I did advocate for a mental health unit for years, but you'll be surprised. No, you won't. In law enforcement, 
you're only allowed to be as smart as your rank, right? So if it's not somebody's idea way up here, it's probably not a real good idea at the time. Um, but that. yeah, but luckily I was a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and it just so happened to be a legislative year, and the chief came to speak at a breakfast. Uh, which we had some legislators in the audience, <clears throat> and it was facilitated by NAMI. And the president for NAMI went up to the front to welcome everybody, and he welcomed the chief and said, hey, chief, while I got you here, uh, have you given any consideration about starting a mental health unit? And I had been begging for years. I'm like, oh, no, like this, I did not put him up to this. Like, they're probably going to send me out to the pound, right, and inventory all these red cars now. And uh, the chief, he stood up and he uh, he walked up to the front. He said, actually, we are going to start a pilot project. And this was 2008. Um, and Ernie's going to be one of the first officers to run this program. And and I just sat there because my heart about stopped because then I didn't know what to do next. Like, how do you how do you do this? I, I'm, I wanted it. But now that I'm about to get it, I don't know what to do. So <clears throat> luckily, we have great collaboration in San Antonio with our local mental health authority, treatment providers and uh, everybody was for this. It was just a, a home run from the get go. That's awesome. Um, and, and we can jump into that there. The statement you just made, I think is super important. So I'm fortunate to, uh, I think I had told you through Twitter or whatever, that I actually am involved in a mental health unit at the agency that I'm at. I, I can't go into a lot of specifics, but they're very forward thinking. And it, as such, I think we have 16 detectives. So it's split up between three squads, three. So there's three squads, three sergeants. Uh, one is a co-responder squad. So I say all that to say to those agencies out there that may be listening or people that want to, because sadly, I, sometimes I have to remember that I am in a uh, ecosystem that is not the norm. <laughs> uh, I'm very fortunate to be somewhere where we have a lot of resources that a lot of agencies across this country don't that I learn in having these conversations on a regular basis. So if someone out there is listening and they're like, and we'll get further into what it became, but if they're thinking about something along the lines of having some sort of mental health unit, how important are having those community resources and having those other partners when you talk about creating a mental health unit for an agency? Well, they're vital for your success, right? Um, I would go and talk to different agencies, you know, because, you know, how do you do this? Like, where do you get started? How do you become sustainable over time? And it really does take a collaborative effort from all your stakeholders in the community, most likely your local mental health authority, because that's going to be, you know, where you get the majority of your staffing when it comes to your clinicians, your access to care, intake appointments, wraparound services. <clears throat> so it, it is vitally important. Uh, there needs to be buy-in from the top um, down, right, within law enforcement, within um, your fire department, your EMS, right, because they're all going to the same calls as well. So making sure that you're all on the same page with the training, I think, is first and foremost, but having the, the collaboration to come in, because if you're on the field and you're trained and you do a good job and you're ready to divert that person, divert to where, right? Um, it's like, hey, we no longer want to take you to jail and criminalize you for your mental illness, but we need to take you somewhere. So where do we go? And that's where your that's where your stakeholders come in and they say, hey, bring them to us. You know, we're gonna we're gonna provide treatment, we're gonna provide stabilization, and then we're gonna provide wraparound services and continuity of care for this patient so they can be productive on the back end of this crisis. Yeah, and that's super, super, super important. When you guys were forming the unit, what made you decide to? Did they stay plain clothes, or was that just something at that time, or how did that battle end? <laughs> so when I was writing this up, I'm like, man, I sure want to wear jeans to work every day, and I kind of want to drive an unmarked car. So that's how I wrote. I mean, I wrote it up that way. I didn't think ever it was going to be approved, but there's there's um, value into it, right? Uh, everybody, you know, you know that the very first use sign of use of force is your mere presence, your uniform showing up. And there's a good chance that uh, somebody that lives with a mental illness and has ever interacted with police might have had a negative outcome at some point or been treated um, rudely or poorly. Right. Yep. Um, so I thought if we can go in plain clothes in an unmarked car, one is going to provide respect and dignity to the patient. Um, but also, I think it's going to be a de-escalator from the very beginning. And stats aren't going to lie for me. You know, over 12 years in the unit, uh, 8,000 involuntary commitments. I never once had a use of force. And I and I really do think that showing up, uh, looking like everyday person and connecting with the person and, and seeing the person and not the problem uh, really played a role in that. 
Yeah. I saw it firsthand. Uh, unfortunately, our units aren't. And anyone who's listening who knows me, I'm not asking these questions because uh, I'm trying to uh, pull something. But I saw that firsthand working in like crimes against persons. So when detectives show up in plain clothes, the response that you get sitting with someone and discussing a case uh, compare, you know, in the front seat of a vehicle in plain clothes compared to what someone else is uh um, compared to someone else in their full uniform and, you know, that law enforcement presence, it just makes a huge difference in how that person responds and talks to you, especially when you're talking more sensitive type investigations. So yeah, I can imagine that that's huge, especially in the uh, mental health space as well. Well, I mean, and you look at your body language, right? Cause when you're in uniform and look at the way the uniforms look now, right? You have these outer carry vests, uh, which mostly the thumbs go underneath when you're talking to somebody for whatever that means. I still don't know what that means. Um, for before that, it was hands on the taser and, and your your elbow on your gun because that's a good resting place for your hands. I was always and, bad but, with this one, Ernie. That one, know. yeah. There you yeah, go. Yeah, the choke yourself <laughs> stance. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't get these right. But yeah. your body language sends a message, and if you're in uniform with all this outer carry vest and, and zip ties and everything shotgun shells now hanging off your, your belt. It, it's intimidating, you know, and I would go to conferences um, where the consumers were the conference goers. And I would do this session called ask a cop and they would be able to ask me whatever they want. And they would all, yeah, I never, it never failed. Wait, why do y'all stand like that? Why do you stand with your hand on a gun and a hand on a taser? And I'm like, it's just a place to rest our arms, you know, our hands. It's, you know, this stuff is heavy and, they're like, well, it's scary. It's aggressive. So I would take that back to the training. Yeah. And we would try to come up with, you know, hands, you know, hands together, like hands in a prayer stance or open and, and inviting to try to change the encounter to be less aggressive. Right. No, I think that's I think that's really good. And I think it's really <clears throat> important. Now, it did appear in watching the documentary, which I want to make sure everybody uh, watches Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. It's available on HBO. And I, I actually watch on HBO Max. So it is available there. Um, your program include, seem to include sections that at some agencies are now separated. So in other words, that it had, um, peer support and resilience, uh, resiliency for officers as well Is was that all encompassing as you guys built this out or. Yeah. So uh, interesting about the peer support program, because we had just started that program probably right before the filming of the documentary and the documentary started filming right around 2016. Okay. So it was actually facilitated and run by one of our police psychologists. So it wasn't anybody in command staff. And you had to apply to be a member of peer support and come in and interview and say why you wanted to do it and why you think you would be a good fit. Um, so originally, I think we had 52 officers uh, on our peer support team. And some of the members of the, of the mental health unit were on that team. Um, but not all of them, you know, it, because it takes a commitment, right? And you have to have boundaries and um, <clears throat> you have to have specific lived and learned experiences to be able to really connect with another officer that is going through something, whether it's traumatic, um, maybe they've been involved in something critical, uh, maybe it's a situation at home. And we try to match the officer with somebody that's got that type of lived experience uh, with the officer that that's going through some issues right then, you know, and, and make this peer connection. Uh, so it just happened to be, it was captured in the documentary. Um, you know, we had, we had some officers get shot, one get killed and they asked us to reach out at roll call. Uh, but not everybody wanted to talk to the mental health unit. Cause sometimes they're like, Oh, those guys, you know, but I'll talk to this guy. He's a peer or this, or this female, she's a peer and I know her and she's good people and I can trust her. Right. So it was very valuable to have these peer support programs uh, up and running. Well, yeah, I can imagine. Um, d has the San Antonio still have it all fall under mental health or has it kind of spread out? Now you have these different. Yeah, it's starting to change now. So within the last 15 months, San Antonio Police Department has had seven suicides on their department. Yeah. Um, so now they have really um, leadership is meeting with city council and other leaderships to try to find a way uh, to look at this issue and say, what do we do? You know, what, what else can be done? Right. right. Uh, so now they are starting a separate unit uh, of wellness and resiliency, which the mental health unit will support is my understanding, which also has peer support on back end and now some technology advancement. 
as far as some applications that officers can utilize as well. So uh, some, I mean, this has been just a horrible, horrible year uh, with at San Antonio this last 15 months. Yeah, that is horrible. And I'm so sorry. And we've had, we have lost a few. In fact, I talk about it openly uh, as to it's kind of my why for starting this podcast. I'd started it a month later, uh, lost an officer here, but uh, we've only lost a few uh, or two um, since I started this podcast. But yeah, it's a tragedy that's going on across this country. Um, we were, I was just in able training, active bystandership for law enforcement. Um, mm-hmm. It's Georgetown University. Anyway, um, I'll probably be talking more about it in, in the future, but uh, it kind of came out of 2020. And it's this idea of if you see something, you know, being willing, no matter what rank you are, to say something is kind of the see something, say something within the law enforcement community. But that being said, uh, one of the gentlemen that was in the class was from Chicago. And that's one of the things we we're talking about is the high rate of suicides they've had in the last, yeah. I want to say it was like 12 to 15 months. So it's definitely something that's affecting law enforcement across this country. One of the, and I don't know how to uh, ask this question without it being a leading question. So I will just kind of say it. But objection, like your... <laughs> objection. <laughs> exactly. There, there's no way to really ask the question without just saying what it, where I'm going with it. But right. what I think it makes, there's many things, obviously, the training in CIT, the advanced specialized classes that they go to, working with uh, area um, providers and those relationships. But probably in my opinion, if you're asking me one of the things that makes these units so effective, it's having more time to deal with people. How important do you think that is? And do you think that is probably one of the most effective tools when it comes to having an actual mental health squad? Yeah, you nailed it, right? Because when, when our chief mandated that all the officers were going to come through CIT training, um, it was a great experience to be able to Uh, train all the first responders as they were coming through, right? Not all of them were bought into it, but by the end of the week, most of them were like, hey, that was some really good training. The part we missed was mid-management, your sergeants and lieutenants. And those are the ones watching time on call, right? Hey, what's taking so long? Let's go, let's go. And so our officers that we would train would then contact us and say, hey, I'm trying to do what you said. I'm trying to spend time. It takes time, but my sergeant's telling me to hurry up and get back in service. So we had to go back to command staff and say, we need to get the sergeants to come through, you know, and they're like, well, it's going to be a little difficult. You know, I'm like, it needs to happen because, you know, without everybody being on the same page, we're going to have a, we have a disconnect. Um, And then what we saw was our dispatchers. When we began to train our dispatchers in CIT, they were very quick to answer the phone and say, please fire EMS and then transfer the call. Boom. Without spending really any time. Uh, because they're so used to once that light starts blinking, a supervisor is going to come over there and say, hey, we got more 911 calls backing up. Get off this call. Transfer it. So we had to backtrack and train call takers and dispatchers and dispatch supervisors, middle management, first line supervisors for, for to get the real picture of, look, these things take time. And if you rush them, you're going to miss out on some very important information, uh, intelligence, data collection. Um, And it could cost an officer or somebody in the public their life if you try to rush these calls. So let's let's pump the brakes, slow down a little bit and know what we're dealing with. Yeah, because it truly is life and death, whether we're talking the citizen or the law enforcement officer. So, no, that's great. And, yeah, I've seen the same thing. So that that is really neat to see something that made me chuckle a little bit when I was watching the movie was um, this. And I don't remember exactly the complete scenario, but essentially a call comes out and uh patrol seems to immediately go call the uh, mental health unit because, you know, th- this isn't us. This is a mental health call. It's got to be theirs. So <laughs> how did you guys end up dealing with that? And that has got to be a universal problem once you have one of these uh, groups. Yeah. Well, at first, you know, we were begging for um, we were begging for the work because we wanted to show that we were being useful and putting officers back in service quickly. But it's like having one traffic unit You know, and San Antonio's got 2 million people, one traffic unit for the highway. Every time you're like, there's no way they can go to every accident, right? So same thing with us. There was no way we could go to every single mental health call. So as the training continued to progress, you know, the the calls at the hospitals where a patient would walk in and present suicidal or homicidal or decompensated, where all the officer had to do was show up and write the involuntary commitment and hand it to the doctor and leave. Like we said, please continue to do those. Like you don't need us for that. Um, but the ones that are a little bit more complicated, um, the, the calls with adolescents, uh, those that have autism, those uh, that maybe you, you, you they just take more resources. 
um, extremely decompensated, extremely violent. These calls are going to take a lot of your resources, a lot of time. Like call us out for those. Uh, those are the ones that we can spend the time on and you can get back to in service and continue those answering those calls for service. So it, it took a little bit of time, you know, uh, for the officers to, you know, get a, get a good understanding of what's a proper call. And there was times to be honest with you, if we were slow, I would look on the screen. Hey, there's a, there's one at the hospital. Let's go take it. Yeah. Big deal and, and keep the officer in service. It'll take us 15 minutes to go over there and scratch it out and go. So uh, we we did really go above and beyond. But I think because we did that, it became the norm and it became very easy for them to get on the radio and, and ask for help. Yeah, that seems to be a universal issue. <laughs> um, so they cracked me up when I saw that. I was like, oh, my goodness, seems like my world. Um, did you guys actually this is just another curiosity question that's coming to me. Did you guys actually assign um, like high utilizers or anything? So in other words, if you had a subject that was um, creating a lot of calls for service for whatever reason and there was a mental health concern, did you guys actually assign that person to a detective or to someone in the mental health unit to follow up with? Yeah. So in the unit, we actually have three clinicians uh, assigned to us from our local mental health authority. So part of their job is to um, go to the high utilizers, right? Find out why you call in all the time. Where's the gap in service? Is it an issue with intake? Is it an issue with um, finding a provider? Is it medication, transportation? And they also helped us with our fusion center with our threat mitigations. So they would go out as well to do assessments on threats that would come in through social media. So we had access to clinicians. Um, two of them were licensed professional counselors and one was a licensed uh, social worker, master's level social worker. So we had really good uh, experienced clinicians that would help us with the high utilizers. And we even uh, created a specialized program called the Program for Intensive Care Coordination. So we identified uh, in with the assistance of the fire department and our treatment facilities and our hospitals, who the top 100 most involuntarily committed patients were in Bear County. So once we knew who they were, and it was easy to find out, uh, we, we started kind of a task force. The hospitals put money into a pot, 1.5 million. With that money, it created two positions for officers. It was me and another officer, two paramedics from our fire department, five um, care clinicians and a psychiatrist, a nurse, and money for patient needs, right? Which we could use for medications, transportation, whatever. So the idea now was to go out and contact the patient before the 911 call would come in. So we had several ways we could do that. One um, is if they showed up at a hospital, we would be notified by the hospital. This high utilizer patient that y'all are looking for just came in. We would head out to the hospital with a clinician and try to do engagement. The second way that we would contact them is when patrol would, would intercept them out on the street on a call or at a house. Uh, because those names were flagged, anytime an officer had to take somebody involuntarily, they had to call one particular number to find out where to take that person. It was a navigator. So that navigator had a list of all the names. So we could find them very, very quickly. And then we would go by their, their last known address. So we would usually have the, the top 100 identified and contacted within the first 30 days. And we would pre-engage the crisis and find out what was the gap? How can we fill that? Sometimes it was, uh, we need a complete ID recovery. So I'd have to spend time with the patient finding their social security card, their ID card, and their birth certificate. From there, I could get them into the Salvation Army or uh, help them with food stamps uh, we would provide vouchers, taxi vouchers for their doctor's appointments. Um, we could have our medics go out and take medications and give medications out in the field. So what we saw was once we started that program, those top 100 who had an average involuntary commitment of about 6.2 a year wow. went down to 1.2 a year, which goes to show that if you have somebody in case management, right, and they're on their medications if they're needed, uh, there's a good chance that they're not going to interact with the acute healthcare system or criminal justice system. So it was a great, great program paid for absolutely. itself. Oh, absolutely. And it's a win, win, win. Cause like you said, the less encounters, the less chance for, you know, things to go bad and, you know, it's just a win all the way around. That's yeah. powerful. Let me ask you another question. And I don't, I don't mean to put you on spot with this question. I'm just kind of curious uh, in the movie, it talks about it, how important or I guess I would term it, how would you say that your faith informs this position? And the reason I ask that question is, I, 
obviously to any listeners who are, you know, you don't have a faith that that's not where I'm going with this question, but I do find that people of faith that when you go into this type of, um, situation where you're dealing with people, I know that more and more often throughout my career, I really do think that, um, my faith has helped in interacting with people, um, going through moments of crisis and so forth in both the law enforcement setting and the mental health setting. And I know that from watching the documentary and then in talking to you that you also are a strong man of faith. So in what way has that, um, informed your response to these type of cases? I think it helped me tremendously because if you look at, if you look at the two subjects in the film, right, myself and Joe, um, we're different, right? Um, I, I have a very strong faith. So does he, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, say he doesn't. Um, my, my faith takes the place of the trauma that I didn't have growing up that he had. Okay. And I think that's important. He was able to connect with people because of his, the way he grew up, he grew up uh, with uh, family violence, sexual trauma, uh, went into the military, had uh, trauma there, uh, trauma, 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 all throughout his life. I didn't have that. So where he was able to connect with people through trauma, I was able to connect with people through faith because in faith, I'm a Christian. My faith is foundational based on others serving others. So it didn't matter that I wasn't riddled in my childhood with trauma. What mattered was that my mindset was that I'm going to serve you and give give of me to you because I'm willing to allow that to happen. And I think that's that's what made me um the, gave me the ability to connect with people uh, where he used kind of a different approach and both of them complemented each other so well that we had great outcomes. I love that. I, that's a really great answer. And yeah, I I can see that. And, and I can see the difference. And, and I really want to encourage the listeners, definitely check out this uh, documentary. I know it, I, I don't know if all law enforcement officers are the same, but for me, it's typically, I don't want to watch another law enforcement movie or, you know, I just, but this, this is really good. It's really well done. How did it come into existence? <laughs> wow. How did Ernie and Joe happen? Man, I still ask myself that. So um, I'll take you back just a couple of years before that. Uh, when we started the unit in 2008, we got a little bit of local press, which led to um, a young lady by the name of Ann Snyder. She was a journalist with The Atlantic. She came down and did a ride along with us. And um, she wrote an article called Policing with Velvet Gloves. And, she, you know, for her, this was like a very strange approach, right? She's from the uh, North uh, from the East Coast, <laughs> up in the Northeast, and this was kind of a different approach. These these cops running around in blue jeans, uh, acting like social workers. So uh, that her story comes out, it gets picked up and seen by ABC News, and Byron Pitts from Nightline comes out and does a ride along, and it's one of those ride alongs that you can't make it up. Like we're kicking doors, doing CPR on people. Like it was an, it was just one of those ride alongs, and the story ran three times nationally, which was the most they ever ran a story because of all the police use of force that was happening against people with mental health diagnoses in a crisis. So they're trying to show this different type of approach. Well, that story got back to the director, Jen McShane, who called me one day and said, hey, I'm a filmmaker. I'd like to come down and do a ride along and, and kind of see what y'all are about. I actually have a friend named Ann Snyder that wrote this article in The Atlantic. I'm like, all right, cool. There's a connection. Come on down. So she shows up, but like she's got no, <laughs> like she's following us with an iPhone, man, <laughs> and no sound crew, no film crew. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, what kind of film is <laughs> is this going to be? <laughs> Little did I know she's extremely brilliant, and she just did not want to um, really impose herself on our day-to-day -day operation. So she knew after the very first call we went on, she goes, hey, guys, um, I'm going to be honest with you. This The way y'all just handled that call, I've never seen anything like this. I want to go ahead and move forward and, and do this film. And I'm like, okay, like with a real camera, like, is this thing going to, she's like, yes, with a real camera. So three years she filmed, uh, she filmed three years, used a local um, uh, cinematographer and audio uh, engineer out of Austin. They were film based out of Austin. So they would, it'd be easy for them to come down and she would fly in from Connecticut uh, for weeks at a time and film for almost three years. And uh, that's, that's how it went. And the film took on a story of its own because we, 
we never really knew what angle it was going to be because what, what's sexy, to be honest with you, about two cops from Texas answering mental health calls? Like, who's 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 going to watch that, right? Like, this is not – like, come on, man. But several things happened, right? Unfortunately, we had uh, several officers uh, involved in uh, some tragic incidents, right? We had one killed, uh, several shot, three suicides uh, within that time. Uh, that happened during the filming. So the the film went from these officers respond to mental health calls to, hey, there's a person behind the badge and you need to know who they are as well, which I thought was very important because that at that, that point, the film became a, about human connection yeah. and not about going on a ride along. And that made a that made the entire difference in this film. Oh, it absolutely did. And that uh, interaction with, I believe her name was Kendra on the bridge. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Really highlights exactly what you just said, that it shows that human connection. And then, of course, you guys following up with her uh, throughout the film as well. Um, it, it, do you stay in touch? Do you know her story? Is it uh, positive? Yeah, Is it, uh, yeah <laughs> we went to lunch. No, no, no. We went <laughs> okay. to lunch um, like about a month ago. In fact, the clinician in the film that was with us to check on her, she happened to be in the area when we were having lunch last month. Awesome. And I called her and I'm like, ah, let me see what she's up to. She's like, I'm just around the corner. So we kind of had like a little reunion um, having lunch. So she, of course, like life uh, up and down, right? She's had some good days, some bad days. Uh, but for the most part, she's very excited about life. Uh, she wants to go back and, and graduate and get her GED. I helped her with her ID recovery. And um, she's excited. She's like, I, I got to get this degree because I, I just don't want to be a work in a kitchen or a restaurant anymore. I want to be, I want to use my mind and be creative and be artistic. And so she's, she's got a good mindset right now. She seems very healthy, um, you know, and that smile, man, she's got that smile that just melts my heart every time I see her. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. A, a powerful part in the story. Um, so definitely I, I won't give away any more on it. I want to make sure that everybody watches that documentary. Uh, in dealing with people in crisis that, it, it affects all of law enforcement, and I understand that. But I would say specifically to mental health, behavioral health units, you're going out to these type of, shall we say, high stakes calls or calls that are life and death, as are all calls. But these obviously, you know, when you're talking to somebody on a bridge, or I think it's even Joe references um, the person who actually jumped from a bridge and so forth. So you're going to these type of calls. How important what should be the response from an agency for the officers when they're going to these type of events all the time? Because I would say that there's probably a higher, a higher likelihood of that secondary trauma, if you would. Yeah. There, and there is. So a agencies across the nation and, and hear me leaders and hear me close, right? We need to build these, these cultures of wellness within agencies and organizations, right? There has to be support in place uh, for all officers. I mean, for us, we were going to mental health calls every single day, four or five calls a day for 12 years straight, right? Never never had a break from that. Um, saw many completed suicides and watched suicides happen in front of us. Um, that type of psychological trauma, law enforcement officers really don't have time to decompress those because as soon as that call is finished, as soon as that person jumped that Joe was talking about, yeah. It was like, okay, y'all need to get back in service because there's calls holding and no officers available. And I'm like, hold on, man. Can I take a breath? Like, can I just, we just talked to this guy for two hours right. you know, and he jumped right in front of it. Like, can I get a breath? No, you got to go. Right. We're, we're in some agencies, especially within fire and EMS, they have the opportunity to do a critical incident stress debrief, right? They can close down that station in some places and have other um, units cover their calls while they kind of debrief this uh, and talk about it, right? Which is healthy. And think what we're doing now. We're asking clinicians, we're asking civilian clinicians to ride along in these co-responder type units yeah. to these types of calls. We've never done this before. We've never asked clinicians to respond to active 911 calls. Now they have gone and responded to calls that come in through a crisis line, but not active 911 calls where somebody's actively wanting to jump or shoot themselves. And now they're seeing these types of outcomes. So it's not just what are we doing for our officers? It's like, what are we doing for our, our organization, our agency, our partners that are now responding to these calls? Now, why don't we mandate that uh, you take a mental health day 
you know, once every quarter? Uh, why don't we give you that time? Why don't we do mandatory psych check-ins once a year? Whether you want to say anything or not, at least right. we have somebody that's available and we're affording you the opportunity. When you have those two things, uh, you have a good chance that somebody's going to finally open up and talk and not wait 28 years like I did to retire and then go, damn, I can take a breath now, but wow, I got a lot to process. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's very important. Have you seen, um, I know you do things across the country. Have you seen agencies kind of spearheading this or is, do we still have a long ways to go? <laughs> oh, we do. Yeah. We got a long ways to go, but there, there's an agency, uh, up near Houston now, smaller agency that now part of the benefits packages, you get one week of mental health leave. So you can use those days, those five days throughout the year, whenever you want. You want to take off a mental health day, uh, which I think is fantastic. Uh, some departments require, San Antonio does now, that if you're involved in a critical incident, uh, that you do see psych services and uh, have an opportunity to talk about it. So uh, there are some champions out there. Uh, Chief Neil Gang over in Pinole, California, uh, he's a huge proponent of the Asher model, which is a seven-pillar approach to building a culture of wellness. And these are these. There are some champions out there, but we need more of them. And we need uh, to break the stigma and be able to have this conversation uh, as normally as you and I are talking and without any judgment. That's yes. where we need to get to. Uh, and I think, I hope we're getting there because we're finally, like your platform is a, is giving people the opportunity to hear this and yeah. know that you're not alone and that there are people that will that will help you. And, and I'm one of them. Feel free to reach out. Your platform does that. So these kind of conversations save lives. Absolutely. And thank you. And yeah, that's that's what it's all about. I, I was talking to someone uh, last week in a class called Traumas Behind the Badge. And in that class, uh, a guy came up to me who listens to the uh, podcast and um, how he had found it. I'm not 100% sure. I think he was through a local academy. But uh, we had this conversation. It was like, you know, if one person to, you know, takes it away, listens, reaches out, whatever, then it's been worth it. And hopefully we can touch a lot more lives than one. But uh, that that's the goal is at least one. And I, th I think it's doing that. So um, let me let's talk about your book. So you have a book, Mental Health and De-Escalation, A Guide for Law Enforcement Professionals. I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so let me tell you how that happened. My buddy, Nick Ruggiero, who's my co-author with this, uh, calls me up one day and he says, hey, you want to write a book together? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, man. I've never written a book. He's like, yeah, let's do one on homicide. I'm like, homicide? I said, I I've worked some homicides, but I'm not like an expert in it. I'm like, what about mental health? And he's like, oh, crap. I forgot. Yeah, you're a mental health guy. Let's do mental health. I'm like, well, I can write about that. So how do you want to do this? He goes, well, I kind of wanted to be a training guide, you know, for officers that don't have the uh, opportunity to go to a, a full 40 hour course that this would be good for, right? Because the, the average police department in the United States is about 12 officers, right? right? So there's a pretty good chance that they're either not going to get a good quality CIT training, or if they do, it's, you know, check the box and, and these are diminishing skills. So we wanted to write a book that kept you sharp, that um, really gave you the foundation of what CIT training was about. So, I said, all right, I'll write it. I'll get around to it. Well, I got COVID. And I'm like, well, now I got nothing but time. So I call him. I said, okay, I'm going to start writing. He's like, oh, man, I feel like crap. I got COVID. I'm like, all right, good. So do I. <laughs> so we never discussed what we were going to write about. He said, you you write like 50 pages. I'll write 50 and we'll see where it goes. I'm like, all right. Well, he was very generous, first of all, because he wrote it from a supervisor standpoint because he was a supervisor. So he addressed totally different issues. Um, in the book than what I talked about. And then he only wrote like 32 pages and he gave me the next 80 or 90. He did not have to do that. He's a very humble guy. And my, my part of the portion of the book uh, talked about uh, crisis intervention training. What is it? Why do we need it? Why is it important? And then what are the foundational classes? What do you know about the federal law MTALA when you take a patient to a hospital? These are important things because a hospital may tell you, no, get out of here. We don't take patients without insurance or or they may do an improper discharge. Well, there's a federal law that protects patients and the officers should know about that, if not for their own family and their own protection. So right. um, I wrote about that and it went number one on Amazon, which I could not believe. I'm like, who is buying this book? And we were getting messages and it wasn't just first responders. It was 
nurses and treatment facilities and teachers and single parents and school. Uh, it was all all different walks of life and saying, hey, thank you. I learned you know something about this. And I know how I think to be a better listener, which makes me a better communicator, right. which can right deescalate a crisis. So it, it's been it's been fantastic. That's awesome. So they can find it on Amazon and uh, at ErnestStevens.com. Yes, yes, yeah. You can get a personalized copy at ErnestStevens.com. Be happy to get one out to you. Okay, perfect. So uh, what is next for your mission? I know you said you're back to working. So what is next for you at this point? Yeah, so I have been blessed. Like whenever one door closes, another great opportunity opens. So right now I've been hired as a deputy division director for the council state government's law enforcement division. So what all that means is that the Department of Justice under their umbrella is the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and they give out a lot of money and grants for agencies that want to start maybe a front end initiative, a jail diversion program, uh, a co-responder unit, a community responder unit. And the difference between the two, for those that don't know, a community responder uh, team would be a clinician and a medic that responds, kind of like the Denver Star program. Or you could have a co-responder team, which would be a clinician and an officer respond to a mental health crisis call. Um, I touch any and all facets of law enforcement, the new 988 crisis line, um, measuring disparities in traffic stops. So I got blessed to be hired to oversee a team that does incredible work to bring these types of opportunities to agencies and departments across all 50 states to try to improve Um, alternative responses to these mental health crises and provide better services both on the front end and on the re-entry side of incarceration. That's great. Um, If anyone wants any information on that, just reach out to you at ErnestStevens.com or? Yeah, that's fine. You can send it there. Or if you need more information, you can go to Council State Government's Justice Center website. Okay. I'll be sure to link that up then in the show notes below. Well, um, I appreciate your time. I got to ask you my one final question that I ask everybody. Um, you've given, we've given a lot of great actionable advice, but I like to boil it down to this final question. So what is the one takeaway, the one thing that law enforcement officers can do that's going to make a difference in their personal lives? Self-care, man, don't wait, like take it serious. And involve your family in the process. Um, There's going to be a great documentary coming out, a film by Deborah Ortiz and Jason Harney called Is There Something Going On at Home? And it takes the lens of the family uh, for this documentary of first responders. So this is an opportunity for you to, um, as you're, if you're just starting out in your career, if you're already in it, think about your own self-care. Make sure that your family uh, understands and supports you uh, through this career because you're you're doing a noble deed, right? You're doing a noble profession, firefighters, paramedics, doctors, nurses, military, all, all our veterans, police officers, law enforcement, but man, it takes a toll. It will take a toll on you and you need support and it's okay uh, because this is a profession that can provide support. So look after yourself, take care of yourself and make sure at the same time that your family is a part of this healing process and part of um, just continuity of care for yourself. That's great. And wonderful advice and something that, you know, it's, it's been neat watching even since only 2019 when I started this podcast, watching the uh, profession evolve. So it's been really neat. Ernie, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on and I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I hope you enjoyed how it slowly got dark behind me throughout this interview. It kind of cracked me up. I I enjoyed that, actually. (laughs) Well, thank you, sir. (laughs) You bet. So how was that? I hope you enjoyed it. I tell you, it was great having Ernie on. So thank you for watching or listening to another podcast. Every episode uh, has full show notes, links, pictures, transcription of the episode on the website, on thebluelinecom or if you just scroll down to however you're watching or listening, uh, the very first link at the very top. See, I try to make it simple for you. Click that link. It'll take you to the show notes page. And on there, pretty much anything more that you would want to know and all the links to everything discussed in every episode is available at that link. So that's all for today. Don't forget that I will see you next Monday in Morning Roll Call. I'm going to see you next Thursday in the interview room. But in the meantime, I'll see you out there on the blue line.